got me quite the noise. <laughs> You want to hold on to it? You're welcome to it. I have multiple times. All right. I do with my purse. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Arlington Public Library. My name is Dana, and I'm the Adult Services Programmer. And I'm here to present our tonight's event, um, the Holocaust Remembrance Day panel, um, Remembering the Holocaust Through the Generations. And we have, um, we do have some questions prepared for the panelists by the Ambassadors for Change, which are some of our high school students here at the High school, and they wrote some questions that are going to be part of our panel discussion as we go. So, I'm going to introduce our panel starting on the left. That's Debbie Doc Sugarman. She is the daughter of Morris Doc, who was deported to Auschwitz in December of 1942 and the only survivor from his family. Debbie is vice president of Restaurant Interpret Inc., which was started by her parents, and she co chairs the Holocaust Education Committee for Jewish Club. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Okay, and we have Dr. Prior to entering the social work profession, she worked in early childhood education, focusing on the impact of poverty on early childhood development. Welcome back, um, Tina, thank you. Thank you. And we have um, Robin Judge, she's a professor at LSU and a specialist in Jewish, trans, the Jewish transnational and gender history, with particular interest in Holocaust studies, the history of anti-Semitism, the history of religion, the history of leadership, and the history of migration. Judd currently serves as the president of the Association for Jewish Studies, the largest international learned society and professional organization representing Jewish studies. Welcome, Robin. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, and thank you all for coming tonight. All right, we're going to start out with Debbie. Okay. I'm First of all, I want to apologize if you see me looking at this. I, my oldest son is getting on a plane in about 45 minutes for Spain. So I just want to make sure <laughs> he's OK. I'm a nervous mother. Um, OK, so I am uh, the child of Morris Dash. My father um, was a Holocaust survivor. The Holoca my dad was born in Points, Poland, outside of Warsaw. The Holocaust was the systemic murder of six million Jews. Why were they murdered? Because they were Jewish. It was also the murder of at least five million others. LGBTQ, the Romas, developmentally disabled, trade unionists, righteous Christians, anyone else that was deemed inferior by Hitler. A million and a half children, innocent children. What could they have ever done to end up with such a fate? Um, my dad was from Ploinsk, Poland, about 45 minutes outside of Warsaw, and he was the youngest. Um, my grandmother ha was one of eight siblings. My grandfather was one of eight siblings. My grandmother actually had eight boys. Four of them survived, and my dad was the baby. So my three older uncles were considerably older than my father. They were married. They had wives. They had children. My dad had aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. My dad was the only survivor from his entire family. And you just feel like part of you is missing because you know, though I had some family on my mother's side, there was always that sense of what would have been, who would they have been, who would I have been knowing them. So my, my dad grew up, he went, there were, there were Jews in points from the 1500s. And uh, my, there were two huge synagogues, half of the population in points was Jewish, the rest Catholic. And my dad went to um, religious school in the synagogue for his primary school and middle school. And he said that every day walking to school, the Pauls would be screaming, dirty Jew. They'd be throwing stones. They'd be hitting them with sticks. And it, w it was just hard to be Jewish in Poland, e even in, in the early 30s. And that was just when Hitler was coming to, to power. 
And one day, you know, he got really beaten up and he went home and he was crying to my grandfather, Laser, and my grandfather said, come back here crying again and don't defend yourself and I'm going to give you something to cry about. So my dad said that to me many times over the years. <laughs> have to stand up for yourself. So he did. And, uh, but it didn't make life any easier. And Hitler was coming to power. One day my dad went with his oldest brother Simcha to Warsaw and there was a gentleman, Jabotinsky, and he was speaking in, uh, by the Warsaw, where the Warsaw Ghetto would be. And he said, all of you Jews have to get out of Poland. You, you must leave. Hitler's coming, he's gonna kill everybody. You have to go. Nobody would take us. Americans didn't want us, Roosevelt, no. Churchill didn't want us, the French didn't want us, the Italians didn't want us. We had no homeland. We had nowhere to go. So even though he said, get out, there was nowhere to go. So everybody knew things were going to get tough. I, mean, I don't think anybody dreamed what was to come. My grandmother, Devorah, had a brother and sister uh, that left in 1918. They went to Boston. So they were, two of them got out and they settled in Boston, Massachusetts. The rest of them all stayed in Poland um, along with my dad's family, though. He knew some of them left from the Dash family and went to a big city. He thought it was Chicago, and in recent years, I found out they actually went to Philadelphia and found some cousins that we never knew about. So things started to get harder in Poland, and eventually Hitler invaded, and Poland, you know, fell in a matter of a week, you know. And people ask me, well, why didn't people fight back? Why didn't the Jews fight back? Why didn't the Poles fight back? They came in with heavy equipment, with tanks, with guns, with, with planes, with bombs. We had sticks and stones. I mean, that's basically why it went as quickly as it did. So the Germans came into Poland and they took Poland over and, um, you know, things started to change for the worse when you couldn't think it would get much worse and they started to mark people. So the Jews were marked with a yellow star. It said J-U-D-E, Juden. And, um, and those were the first people that were marked. In points, they put a star on the front and back so they could see you coming and going. Some places, it was only on the front. And then they wouldn't let the um, people of points deal with the Jews. So their businesses were only allowed, only Jews were allowed to deal with them. Well, that wasn't any good. That, that was, people were starving. And eventually, they formed the ghettos. So what they did was they took the people out of the kind of low-income housing, the Poles, put them in the homes of the Jews, and they moved the Jews all into this one area, and Dad said they put up all this barbed wire fencing around it, and that was the ghetto. And they, they so, Depending on what you read about points, there were anywhere from eight to 12,000 Jews and they were put into this very small area. They could take one suitcase with them each and there would be like eight people in one small room in a building, in an apartment building. So there was no indoor plumbing, there was no electricity. I mean, it was cold, Poland is, very, very cold, and uh, people started dying because there was lice, and lice brought typhus, and people got tuberculosis, and of course Hitler wanted people to die. We're talking about the final solution, and uh, every morning you'd have to pull the people out of the apartments that were dead, and you'd put them onto a cart in front and they would take them to mass graves and they would burn them. So 
that was the beginning. So Jews couldn't go in and out of the ghetto, but my, my dad was a bit of a hellion, and he would take his star off, and he would go out, and he would barter, and he would try to get some food, and he'd try to get some coal or some wood uh, so they could be warm. But my family was ultra-Orthodox, and they believed strictly in eating kosher, and you know, they, they wouldn't eat anything my dad brought back. You know, the, it wasn't gonna happen. I mean, they were dying for their religion and, and that they did. So one day they, they came and they got a bunch of the young guys, my dad being one of them. They put them in a truck. The truck took them out to the country. They had to dig a long, narrow ditch. And um, they brought the people in other trucks in from points and they told the guys that dug the ditch to walk away and turn their back and they shot the people into the ditch and then my dad and the other fellows they had to uh, bury the people well the problem was the germans wouldn't waste extra bullets the people weren't dead and they had to bury these people alive and my dad told me that the earth was moving and you know the people are looking at you and you know my dad was 18 years old and and he had to do this over and over and over again and um, they'd also they desecrated the cemetery and they used the stones from my great-grandparents my great-aunts and uncles and and they built you know used them as pavers to build the roads. My father and the other fellows, they had to shovel the snow. I mean, and it snows about eight months out of the year in Poland. My youngest son was there nine years ago this past week on March of the Living. They had a foot of snow. So it, it's, it's cold. So eventually, after a couple years in the ghetto, um, they were liquidating the ghettos. Now, if you lived where there was a train station, you got a one-way ticket to a death camp, a concentration camp, a work camp. Any of these camps were going to end up in your death. If you lived in a town that didn't have a railroad track, you were taken into gas vans where carbon monoxide was put into the back of the van and the people were murdered that way and then they were thrown into mass graves and burned or there were killing fields where the Germans just shot them. So my father, there was uh, train tracks, uh, there was a train station in Ploinsk and everybody from Ploinsk was deported to Auschwitz. And uh, the first group that went, uh, was my grandparents. They were the elderly and the disabled. And, and you know, when I think about the elderly, I'm much older than my grandparents were when they went to Auschwitz. And every week, 2,000 people left points until the, um, everybody was, was out of there. So my grandparents went October 28th on 1942. And it was a three-day trip, and they arrived in Birkenau. Auschwitz had three camps, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II Birkenau, which was really the largest killing camp. And there was Auschwitz III, which was Buna or Monowitz, which were factories. And uh, then there were hundreds of subcamps from all the camps, Auschwitz, Dachau, everybody. They all had tons of subcamps that were work camps. So um, two weeks after my grandparents left, my uncles, two of my uncles left um, with their families, my, and my dad and his um, brother that was five years older than him, they left two weeks later. So they all went to Birkenau, and um, my dad said when they got on the cattle cars, of course there were no seats, and uh, there were two buckets, one had water and one was for human waste, and they were literally packed in like sardines. And so they each had a suitcase and 
for three days they rode and they got off in Birkenau and Dr. Mengele was actually the one standing on the um, platform who was directing who was going to the right and who was going to left and who was going to live and who was going to die. But technically everybody was going in there to die. Nobody was going in there to come out. They were just going to be worked to death if they weren't set immediately to uh, the gas chambers and the crematorium. So 1,500 people went to death that arrived with my father and 500 went to work. So after three days on this transport, when somebody says you're gonna take a shower, here's your soap, pile up your suitcases, pile up your clothes, make sure your shoes are tied together, and you know, when you come out, you'll have all of your things to put back on and then you'll go to your barracks. But that wasn't to happen. They were all stripped naked. They all nicely put their things in order and they went into the gas chamber and the Zyklon B gas came down and they were gassed to death. Well, when that happened afterwards, uh, the Jews had to go in they had to pull the bodies out after the gas dissipated. And when they pulled the bodies out, the first thing, they had to shave their hair. And the hair was used, they stuffed pillows and comforters because the Germans needed to be comfortable. It was all sent back to, to Germany. Uh, when you got a filling, it was solid gold. So they had to take pliers and pull the gold teeth out and uh, then the bodies were piled up and they were taken to the crematoriums. My dad, he got in line with the 500. They, he was stripped and um, he was, they shaved him from head to toe because if lice came in, then that brought typhus and typhus would kill the people and they wouldn't have a workforce. So they shaved him from head to toe and then they used a disinfectant to kill any bugs on him, and he said it felt like your skin was on fire. And then they gave him the striped pajamas and wooden shoes and little beanie. And then they gave him his new identity. His name was uh, Moshek Dach in Poland, and he became prisoner number 83988. 83,988 person to arrive in Birkenau. So he went and stood, they had to stand and get counted in to the barracks and he was standing in front of the barracks and he asked the guy next to him, you know, what happened to all the people that came in with him and the guy pointed to the smokestacks and said, there's where they all are. Everybody's being burned. That's where your family went. Oh, so my father, told me at that point he didn't want to live, and um, he told the German officer to shoot him and kill him, and the German officer said just what they said when he was burying people alive, we're not wasting a bullet on you, so you're going to die anyway. So the, at night you were counted in, the same amount had to come out in the morning, same amount of people. If the same amount of people didn't come out and you didn't produce either a body or a person, you were gonna be in trouble and you'd probably lose your life. The barracks um, was like sleeping on pallets. There were three to four people on a pallet. They were like this wide. They, they didn't have blankets. They, they didn't have pillows, and they didn't have much body heat after they lost all their body weight from being worked to death. So they went in. If somebody died during the night, you put the person on the ground, you looked in their pockets to see if they had a piece of bread, you checked to see if their shoes were better than yours because you needed
everything had to be perfect with the Germans. I mean, you couldn't have a little tilt. And so my father, again, he was a piece of work. <laughs> That's why he survived. He would make it a little tilted. They'd make him take it all down, start all over again. He was a pretty smart guy. And so my dad was in there over two years. At, at one point, he was sent um, to Auschwitz III, to Buna, to Monowitz, with his, his brother Shapsa, who was in Birkenau with him. And they got there, and they were going to work in a factory. And uh, they saw somebody from Ploinz, and the fellow said, your brothers are here. And so it took three days, and he saw his two oldest brothers for the last time. And then typhus broke out, and he and uh, Shapsa were sent back to Birkenau. And then he, his brothers were murdered there. He never saw them again. And then my uncle Shapsa, <coughs> he was murdered in, um, in Birkenau. So my dad went between Auschwitz I and Birkenau. And uh, then they sent him for six months to Yinina, which was a subcamp, which um, was a um, coal mine. And they didn't give them any masks or respirators or anything. And they had very primitive tools. And I mean, my dad was missing a whole chunk out of his hand. And you know, when you got hurt like that, the only way to take care of that was to urinate on the wound to try to sterilize it. I mean, they figured things out to try to stay alive. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. And one of his friends, his son, wrote a book. And I read the book. He's a dermatologist in New Jersey. And he was talking about my dad telling his father to do that when he had the injury. So it's like, wow. So, you know, the Russians were coming upon Auschwitz and Birkenau and Monowitz. And, my dad was back in Birkenau, and uh, Hitler said, the world is never going to know what happened. And they started to bomb out the crematoriums, and they were trying to bomb out the barracks. But the Russians were really pushing hard on the camp, and they, you know, the Germans started to flee. And what they did was they took out all but like 7,000 people who were too sick to go out on the death march. And in January of 45, they went out on a death march into the forest of Poland heading to another camp. They didn't know what camp they were going to. They were just no coats, <laughs> no food. The Germans might have had coats and boots. They didn't have any food. They had a gun. And they're going on a death march to God knows where. I mean, they had no idea where they were heading. But my dad said the, the Germans were, the soldiers were dying. I mean, they, they would eat the snow, but the cold. And the people were dying, and the forest was littered with bodies. And, and after three days, he decided, I'm going to run into the forest. If they shoot me, fine. If they don't, I, I, you know, he was going to die anyways. He didn't tell anybody he was going to run. And he took off running, and two guys actually followed him. So then they were wandering around, and they would sleep in barns. They would sleep under trees. They finally found a farmhouse, a uh, Polish farmhouse, and nobody was in there, and they broke in. And they stayed there. And then the Polish uh, farmer came back. And he actually didn't turn them in. And he let them stay for a bit. But then the Germans were coming. And he said, I'm not dying for you guys. So they were wandering. And he has no idea how long he wandered. But um, eventually, the Russian army found him. And he, they were liberated by the Russian army. They had no idea where they were in Poland. I mean, not a clue. And the Russians said, here's guns. Go out and kill Germans. And my father was not interested in killing anybody. And uh, he just wanted to get back to points. He, he knew. He told me he knew everybody was dead. 
but just on the chance. So he uh, got back to points, the Russians got them back there, and 50 people came back, and some of them were some of his friends, and uh, they couldn't get into my grandparents' home because the Poles wouldn't let them in, but they managed to get into his uncle of room's home, and so five of them were staying there, and they were, they didn't know what to do. I mean, they really had, a religious education, they had no f skills, they had no formal education, but my dad didn't know how to lay bricks. And um, they, they had been through such trauma. I mean, one of the, the fellows, my dad's best friend in Boston, Irv Irving Wasserman, he was a, a little guy who was very, very handsome, and he was used by the German soldiers for sex. And, um, and then the one whose son wrote the book, Dr. Mengele removed one of his testicles. I mean, these people went through living hell. And then after a couple months, there's a knock on the door. I mean, they're doing odd jobs and they've got enough money to live and it's the Polish army and you're drafted. And it's like, no. Nah. <laughs> No, nobody's drafting me to do anything. So my dad went to Lundsburg to a displaced persons camp with the rest of the guys. And um, my dad wanted to go to Palestine. He wanted to go fight. And they said, do you have any relatives that left before the war? And he said, yes, I have an uncle and aunt. They went to, Israel, uh, to Boston. And so their name was Scheinman. And, but when my great uncle got to Boston, he changed his name to Simon to make it more Americanized. So it took two and a half years to find uh, my great uncle, who was very successful in Boston politics, and he had all kinds of property, and he had brought over his wife's whole family from Poland. He had two daughters, and so they found him. Well, um, my dad arrives doesn't speak any English. They put him on a boat. He gets to New York. It's St. Patrick's Day. There's no St. Patrick's Day in Poland. And he was told America was paved in gold, the roads, and he said the people were running around like crazy people and in green, and they were drinking green, and they gave him a green donut, and <laughs> <laughs> total confusion. His relatives, being the lovely people they were not, didn't come. So they put him on a train, and um, he had to take a train to Boston. Well, my father, when he heard train whistles, even when we were at Disney, my husband and I, when our kids were little, he, he couldn't take hearing the train whistle because the train whistle going to Auschwitz. So he took the train, and his cousins came, and. Uh, they could speak Yiddish to him, and uh, they took him to the house, and you know he kind of settled in. And his great his uncle's wife said, "Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. Uh, you don't. What do you have? You don't have an education. You have nothing. I'm going to put you to work in a delicatessen in downtown Boston, and you're going to sweep the floors at night because that's all you could do." So he he went. He signed up for English classes because he was going to be the American citizen like no other. And he was learning English and he was learning the restaurant business. And um, my great uncle contacted this um, young man who was doing real estate in Boston. And they took a ride. He wanted the guy to go with him and look at a piece of real estate. And he was telling my uh, this guy Herb about uh, his nephew. So Herb said, I have to meet your nephew. So they met, they became best friends. Every morning my dad would come out of the deli with a bag of corned beef sandwiches. Herb would help him with his English and he'd make sales calls with Herb. And uh, they were best, best friends. And meanwhile, my dad was learning to make the corned beef and the sandwiches and the potato salad and all, 
such hard work. And uh, one Shabbat in November, um, Herb took Dad home for Shabbat dinner to his mother's. And his, Herb was, had, there were three brothers and a sister. And the sister came in and he looked at the sister and in February he got married. <laughs> My father, again, he was a risk taker and she was a big risk taker. My mom was first generation American and, but to take on somebody with all the PTSD, that was, that was really something. So uh, they were married and uh, eventually my grandmother took my dad to find his own location for a deli in Natick, Massachusetts. My dad went to his uncle and said, can I borrow $3,500 for six months to open my restaurant? And he said, no, his wife. And see, this isn't a story that's unique to me because when I talk to all of my friends, their relatives got the same, how do you do? And so um, my dad went to the bank and the banker believed in him and gave him the money. And so my father opened his deli, bought a little house in Natick, and I was born two weeks later. And my brother two years after that. And, uh, you know, my dad had a, a successful business and uh, they had a good life, but you know, when I, I, I was getting older and I, I was starting to realize there was something really different about my father. First of all, he had a number on his arm and my girlfriend down the street, Barbara, her father had a number. So I said, what do you think the number is? And she goes, it's our phone number. <laughs> I'm my father's daughter. I go running up the street no. I go run back down the street. That's not the phone number. I said, you better ask. So I went to the library every day when um, my, my mom would get us at school and she'd close the deli and dad would come home and at four o'clock he'd be asleep and Larry and I were on our own. So um, I went and I said to the librarian, do you have a book on if somebody has a number? And she gave a seven-year-old Treblinka. So, I read and I kept reading and eventually my mother found the books under my bed that I was hiding and um, my mother never knew what to do with me. So she <laughs> called her mother who came to Natick and um, said, oh, okay. And so, you know, little by little, I, I was really afraid to ask my dad because I thought, well, you know, he doesn't think about this all the time. I mean, I'm a little kid. I, I didn't realize the nightmares and the screaming every night were him thinking about it every night. I, I just didn't want to bring it up. But at that point, I knew what happened. I knew why he didn't have any brothers and why my mother had brothers. And, and uh, you know, and I, I kept reading and eventually my father sat me down after my grandma told me a lot. But uh, he sat me down and he started, started talking. So that's, you know, how I started learning. And then, you know, people didn't really talk about the Holocaust when we were kids. And, uh, but when they started to talk about the Holocaust, my father went all over and talked about the Holocaust. I mean, Chopper 4 flew them all over Ohio. And, and, uh, and I, I lost him 18 years ago, so I do that now. So um, we, we ended up in Columbus because of Herb. <laughs> he had moved here because, you know, building business was good in Ohio. And then my, my grandmother and an un another uncle came. So that's how I ended up in Ohio. And my father was always wheeling and dealing. And we always had, like, cars he'd be selling and dough mixers and slicers, stuff for delis. And, uh, my father started a business called Restaurant Equippers, and uh, I, I'm a nurse. My brother has a degree in communications. He, education was paramount to him. He was denied. He wanted nothing more than to have an education, and he'd be proud of the five kids because they're all well educated. And uh, you know, so 
he and my mom did the business. They had a little building, and then my brother came back from California, and he started in, and then my father said, come on, get out of the hospital, have decent hours. And so um, my brother and I own restaurant equippers um, that my parents started, and we have a location here and in Philadelphia and Detroit, and the ca big catalog business, and look what my father did, the person who could only sweep floors. And I tell kids, you know, when I speak, that it's so important to get an education. I mean, education, knowledge is power. And the reason we have so many problems is because people don't know and, and they don't learn and, you know, and kids are bullies and, you know, we've all been bullied. And it, it, it's, it's just paramount for everybody's survival to, to do this. So in 1984, and Robin's going to show the pictures for me, um, I had to go to Poland. I just had to go and see where my father came from. So my father took my brother, myself, my best friend Paul from California, and my cousin from New, uh, New York. And we went and was communist. It was Russia then. And so that's the Warsaw Ghetto Monument. That was the one synagogue in Warsaw that the Americans came and rebuilt. Uh, in front of the cemetery, yes, I had a permanent. <laughs> That my father, myself, that's my brother Larry, my cousin Mark, and my best friend Paul. And they had desecrated the cemetery. The Americans have actually come in, my son showed me pictures, and they rebuilt the cemetery. But, um, but at least there were stones there. They didn't do what they did in Ploinsk and some of the other cities. That was my dad in front of the pump in Ploinsk. Every day they had to go get water at this pump. That was the only place for the whole city. And that was where the cemetery was. They made a little monument because there's no graves. I mean, they, the Germans desecrated the whole cemetery, so. And that was uh, where my grandparents lived, but we were walking. And these guys recognized my father and were like, you're alive? <laughs> but as my son, nine years ago, was walking into that cemetery with the group he was with from Columbus and Cleveland when they were on March of the Living, a woman was standing in front of the cemetery screaming, you Jews, why do you come back? We thought we killed you all. What are you doing here? And my son called me absolutely hysterical. And I said, Aaron, that's why you're here. And nothing changes. And um, a woman allowed me to take a picture of Ploinsk. That was um, my dad's friend. She had his photo album and his family's tea set, and, but she wouldn't let us have anything because she's took at her family and it belonged to her. So that, that was points when it was booming back in the 30s. And that was one of the two synagogues. They were both huge. They were both orthodox. And this was the cattle car at Treblinka. And that's what they rode in. And Treblinka now, it's, they have stones and memorials and all, but that was just the killing fields, the just mass graves. This was in Majdanek. You walk through the barracks. One barrack was top to bottom with hats. One was top to bottom with shoes. Majdanek was is in Lublin. I stood in the center of Lublin. I saw the concentration camp. Lublin's a very big city. I saw the train tracks that were going into Majdanek. Where did the people think? Oh, people are coming in and nobody's coming out, but nobody knew about this?
when we walked through the shoes and there was this much room to walk through, Paul and I came out the other end and, and just laid on the ground and uh, we were sick. Physically, I mean, you could smell the leather, you could... And these are all people. All people that were murdered. And there's the gas cans. Now we're in Birkenau, in the barracks. And those were the barracks. When you see the pictures now, it's all very manicured. Mm -hmm. And trees are planted, and the get grass is cut. This is what mm -hmm. I saw. Those were the train tracks heading into Birkenau. The crematoriums that were bombed out. Ex medical experiment table. People used to throw themselves against the wire just to kill themselves because it was electrified. Those were Polish soldiers that my father ended up leading a tour <laughs> because he said they needed to know we already knew. Mm. So, and those, that's what you see. Those are the pictures you see. But now when you see it, it's manicured. It's my brother and I. But you know, he tried to destroy everything, but you, you couldn't destroy all of this. And you certainly couldn't destroy the memories. And that's my dad's number, 83988. And those are the tracks he rode in on. And that's where he slept. Those the latrines, the wash basins. They never put wood in the stove. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't know how anybody survived. Thank God they did. Mm -hmm. Those were the carts that they would take the bodies to the crematoriums with. Mm. That's the gas chamber. And the crematorium. The oven. And I walked my father through those gates, Arbeit Mach Frei. Mm. That really hit me. But he said that the gates couldn't close behind him again. Mm -hmm. But he was, quite, and he had no hatred. He helped everybody, Poles, Germans, I mean, anybody that came into our business, he helped. No hate. And that was the wall where they shot people, execution style. They had gallows and And we were in Yenina, that's where the um, um, coal mine was. And that was my grandma, that was my uncle Shapsa, my father, and my uncle Toibia. My grandfather and my oldest uncle Simcha weren't there, they were in Warsaw. People didn't have cameras, the photographer came through town. And my grandma sent that to um, her brother. Mm. And that's how I have the picture. And I'm, I'm named after her, that's Devorah. And those, Hitler didn't win. That's my niece, Nicole, my nephew, Jacob, my oldest son, Scott, my niece, Emily, and my son, Aaron. And Hitler did not win, we won. Thank you. Thank you.
you, Debbie. It's um, just so amazing um, to be in a room with you, um, and and I and um, it's it's really kind of always always takes my breath away uh, to to hear to hear your story um, and your father's story and. Um, and I've never seen these photos, so I'm, I'm still sort of catching my breath. Perhaps because we're, um, we're focused on sort of some of the questions of, of intergenerational trauma, and, um, and perhaps too because, I, because I've never asked you about how it was that you learned your father's story, um, and I'm hearing uh, sort of an interesting parallel. So when I was eight years old, my um, father came home to, with much excitement to tell me that um, my mother had given birth to a boy. We actually wanted a girl, um, but uh, <laughs> a boy, and that his name was going to be Jason. And my sister and I were deeply disappointed because we had names and none of them were Jason. Uh, and so, I said, Jason, that's the worst. Name. And if any of you know my brother, please don't say anything to him. I mean, he knows the story. <laughs> and I said, Jason, that's the worst name ever. Like, how could you choose a name like Jason? My father, who, who never real, like, never cried. He would get angry, but like tears came to his eyes, and he said that was my father's name. And my, and then he walked out. And my sister and I were totally confused because, as far as we knew, his father's name was Joseph, not. Jason, like who was Jason? Um, and my father said nothing more, and it was only when my mother came home with the baby, who wasn't so bad after all, especially when you dressed him in whatever clothes you wanted to, girls clothes yeah. were, um, <laughs> told us that in fact my father was a child survivor and that his father had been named Yitzchak. Um, and so I too uh, learned of my father's sort of narrative as a survivor when I was around eight years old. Um, and. Um, and I'm struck uh, by the ways in which these narratives of trauma have shaped you as somebody who has kind of taken on the narrative of your father and sort of shares the narrative of your, of your father, and me, someone who really can't share much of a narrative about my father, who was a child in hiding and remembers a little but mostly kind of sounds and spaces and smells, um, but nothing more. And so, you know, what did I do? I turned into a different kind of storyteller, right? One who works with students and talks about the history of genocide um, and shares the narrative that way. And your comment about the million and a half children struck me um, for in two ways. First, how Often we forget that the narrative of survivors is really a narrative of children and emerging adults. Right. That um, survivors were on the whole between the ages of 16 and 25 years old. Um, I mean, that's so remarkable. And when I sit in front of my classes of 150 students who are themselves mostly within that age group, um, I am so struck uh, by the fact that this was the age of our survivor generation, right? right. Your father was of that age group. Um, folks who were older didn't survive, and no. most of the folks who were younger also did not. Um, and indeed, my father um, was at, lived in the town of Humana in Slovakia, where there were about 1,600 Jewish children before the war. Five of them survived. Um, and, uh, and in fact, one of them uh, and my father were friends really forever because the, my grandmother, right. who also survived, and her mother, who also survived, you know, kept in touch um, over the years. And, um, and so I think, you know, kind of in, in holding that space of trauma and, and how it shapes us, maybe I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. Um, I want to make sure we have time for Q&A, and I want to hear your wisdom about um, kind of trauma and, and offering that, and then I'll kind of bring it back, and we'll maybe talk about um, some of the questions that got asked, but also 
um, some of the things that I think have come up, um, at least, Debbie, in your words, and then I'm curious to hear from you. So I'll hand the floor over. I'm going to switch gears just a tiny bit initially to just sort of talk about trauma writ large, as opposed to um, this specific trauma, which clearly this will apply to. Um, we live in a time that in many ways um, we are blessed, that the whole, narr the whole concept of trauma has entered the public dialogue like it never had before. Even you think about returning soldiers who in my generation, the Vietnam soldiers, did not get honored, nor was their trauma um, acknowledged for what it was. So we do have a, um, a new awareness of, of trauma and an awareness in our culture for the most part or at least an emerging awareness of the link between trauma and mental health. Um, so I want to talk just a tiny bit about how we understand trauma, um, those of us that work in the mental health field. When we talk about trauma, we sort of use this idea of um, three E's. Trauma is an event, how the event is experienced, and then the effect of that event. Not every event that's horrific is a traumatic event. An event that is horrific, that is potentially life-threatening, how that is experienced by the individual determines if that's going to be what we call in our vernacular a traumatic event. Two people can experience the same event, and depending on a number of different variables that um, we don't have time to go into today, it can be experienced very differently. One person can be shaken up by this and in a day or two be fine. An another person can experience the same event and for many reasons can have that event linger for an extended period of time. And how we know whether or not we're gonna classify that as a trauma is looking at the effect. Meaning, is this something that lingers over time, years, a lifetime? Or is it something that, that one can return to normal functioning within a day or two or a week? Um, there's a number of reasons why trauma can affect someone over a lifetime. But some of the emerging research that I find quite fascinating is what we are learning about, we've known for some time about the psychological effect. But what we are learning now, because we've got just technology and science and whatnot that has allowed us to really understand what happens in the body when someone experiences a traumatic event. Um, we talk about trauma happens in the body because when a life-threatening event, when we as humans are presented with a potentially or perceived life-threatening event, our brain, which is remarkable, the human brain is absolutely remarkable, and our brain is, has evolved or is designed so that when a potentially life-threatening event happens to us, it goes straight into the brainstem, bypasses the cortex, goes straight into the brainstem, and immediately the body goes through a cascade of all kinds of responses that prepare the body to fight or flee or freeze. So the top part of your brain shuts down, the lower part of your brain kicks in, and all sorts of chemicals and hormones and neurotransmitters cascade so that literally out of your control, your heart starts beating faster, sending blood to your extremity so that you are able to run if you need to, you're able to fight. Your vision literally narrows. You don't choose for it to narrow. It literally narrows. 
all sorts of things happen internally without your conscious awareness, certainly not with your conscious choice, to prepare yourself to have the energy that you need to fight or to flee, and should it be an extremely threatening event, your body will literally contract so that should you be wounded, you will not bleed as much. You will not feel pain as much. You will basically prepare to die. All of these things happen out of our control, but they happen through our central nervous system, and it impacts how our central nervous system then responds. If it happens once, and you've had a better than bad la life prior to that, your body can absorb it. But when you have events that are chronic and ongoing and continuing, and your body day after day after day is exposed to this chronic threat and stress, it's literally like you're exercising a muscle, but what you're exercising is the threat response system that goes all through your body. So that basically, we talk about it in my world of being sensitized, so that you are now, you're not set, your, your stress barometer is not set down here, it's set up here. You live in a chronic, ongoing state of potential arousal, of alertness. The body doesn't calm down because you have overworked that central nervous system and literally, literally changed the architecture of your brain. And because this happens in the body, it's out of our control. The other thing that's, that's um, a gift that humans have is our ability to make meaning of what happens to us. So when something happens and we experience it as a threat, the first thing that happens is our body responds. The second thing that happens, if it's you know, not so extreme, is our brain kicks in, the top part of our brain, and we begin to make sense of that. We start to build our story. We start to interpret what we're feeling and creating a story of it. But the, the reality is it, it hits the body first. Then the brain kicks in, not the other way around. Sense precedes story. We create a story to make sense of why I'm feeling this way. And then that story, that meaning, that narrative we create, then becomes our way of viewing all the events that happen that are like that after that. When trauma, when the threat is interpersonal, when it's not a tsunami, <laughs> when it is people who have been the source of the threat. It impacts our neurobiology that allows us to interact with other people in a way that brings us a sense of pleasure. Humans evolved over time because our only way to survive as a species is to band together. Humans don't do well on their own in the wilderness. Um, we, we don't, we're not porcupines, we don't have quills, we don't run like jaguars. Our only way to stay alive is to form groups and together develop strategies to manage predators. People who formed those groups and found, found safety among other people stayed in the gene pool. The ones that wandered off, they're not in our gene pool. They weren't become, they got beaten, eaten by the bears or the lions. They're not our ancestors. Humans evolved, those of us who are ancestors, to find pleasure and safety in people. Researchers today talk about our social brain. And um, when, however, that interpersonal relationship has been so damaged because people 
were the predators and there was that chronic rewiring, it literally changes our natural neurobiology that allows us to interact with people and find safety with people. Again, the degree to which that happens, the, the ability to move past that varies from person to person, but it sets us up as you can, I hope, connect the dots to the challenges associated with intergenerational trauma. So one may now be in a safe place, but one's never in a safe place. A and what to me, I can, I have the privilege that I can experience safety in people, others can't. And so, how they interact with their children, how they interact with um, people in their world, the meaning that they make and the stories that they tell and the narratives around the role of other people in your life, of course, then shape how they raise their children and, and their children's lived experience. Um, so, I think it's, I talk about the body piece of trauma a lot because I think it's really important that we realize that our response to horrific <laughs> things is not a sign of our character. It's not about our character. It's about how your body functions and how your body adapted to a horrific situation. They talk about trauma is a normal response to an abnormal situation. The problem is when it's happened so long over time and you're now out of that abnormal situation, you've built a neurobiology to allow you to survive in this situation. And it doesn't go away. And so it impacts every aspect of your life. And um, thus we see the generational impact. Uh, and so evident in the Holocaust, but we see it every day with children whose parents grew up in violent situations and they had their own childhood trauma and now they're raising children and somehow we think they should parent the way I parent mm -hmm. with my privilege. So that's a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. But, um, is that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm so struck by so much of what you said um, and, and this sense of, well, the, that sense precedes story um, and how that then factors into this intergenerational narrative of the Holocaust. And maybe we can begin there because indeed one of the questions that one of our ambassadors of change asked was about like how the trauma of parents then affects um, us and you know and our children, um, and maybe Debbie, you can kind of say first if, if you're comfortable. All those poor kids. I know. Well, I was just thinking, <laughs> right? Same thing. Right? We're, I, what we say in this room stays in this room, right? I mean, I'm, um, no, I'm just looking at right, them, but you want yeah. Me to slip a, a slip of the side to the. The they, Debbie Sugarman's thing. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this way they're yeah, not judging. I, I, I mean, first of all, I mean, I felt so guilty about what my father went through. Yeah. yeah. Terribly guilty. I mean, I, I was too young to realize there was nothing I could have done to change anything. But. I, I, you know, if I did something wrong, I, I didn't, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, I don't know, if I could have carried him around, <laughs> I, I would have. He wouldn't have allowed it, but, <laughs> but I, I would have. But, you know, they're, they're just, there wasn't anything easy about their lives. I mean, and even my dad's friends, I mean, they, they ha all had such terrible health issues, and, yes. and, it, and it came from what they went through, from malnourishment and, and, and you know, 
they were sick all the time and you know we didn't have cell phones and so you were always like oh is the phone ringing did I miss a call there were you know and my kids saw that <laughs> you know and, and they saw that even though Scott was old enough to, to really remember with my dad. The other ones were a lot younger, but then they saw it as I took care of my, my uncle, and then my mom passed away three years ago. I mean, they just, there, there was not enough we could do. That's why a lot of us went in, you know, doctors, nurses, lawyers, you know, to be able to help people and do anything you could do. And that's, I, poor Chuck, I kind of go over the, the edge on all of that. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> wow, well, Chuck, Chuck and, it is, right, yeah, right. I, I, Chuck, well, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, right, right, he's, what it is. Right. Chuck, right. he's yeah. on the plane, right, yeah, on. I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, it's, I, yeah, no, I mean, I, um, uh, I remember when my sister, uh, who, who has a, a PhD in, in clinical neuropsychology, when she started her studies in psychology uh, in college, she called me, and again, days before cell, and she said to me, we always tried to protect dad. Yes. <laughs> just, yes. We, I mean, you know, again, like, cause this was before one studied psychology in high school, so, you know, we um, and and so we, you know, we also both my sister and I kind of went to these roots, right? She she ended up making a career out of studying um, adolescents who experienced trauma. I made a career out of studying um, survivors who experienced trauma, uh, and certainly, you know, I, I thought a lot about um, how to talk to my children about the Holocaust. Like for me, you know, the one of the takeaways was that I didn't want it to be like a surprise announcement. Um, right. But uh, but kind of how to do that, and and I grew up in a in a community where there were where there were still survivors around, right? Where there were lots of people who spoke English with accents with an accent. And, but you know, I didn't realize my dad had an accent because that was just my dad and the way right. he talked. Somebody yeah. said to me, wow, your dad has quite an accent. And I'm like, huh? Well, and my dad, I don't think did, did or does because, of course, he came he was a child. But my grandmother yeah. did. And my father and grandmother survived together. And my grandmother almost never, I mean, when she died, she let go of my dad. But she was 92. Um, and so, you know, so my kids kind of remembered her and her accent, but it was, but it was unusual. Um, yeah. But they did. I mean, they definitely were aware of that narrative. We, I spent way too much time thinking about, you know, how old should they be the first time they go to which Holocaust museum, and which was the first one I was going to take them to. Oh yeah. And oh, I threw my kids into it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, yeah. Right? No. So, you know, six years old, he's watching a tape with three survivors, one being my father, talking about the horrors of the Holocaust. And I get home and I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> but you know. It was a movie. The, the books under the bed. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Movies, Is that consistent with what you find kind of in terms of the scholarly world of children? Who kind of grow up with narratives of, of parental trauma? Kind of what are, what do you see in the in terms of your world of how they respond? What are some of the models? You know, it, it really varies. Mm. I, I work with a mm. lot of kids who are not with their fa families, who are right. in foster care, right. or mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a very different. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very different 
way mm -hmm. of experiencing trauma. We talk, it, we talk a lot about developmental trauma. So about, and, and an understanding of what part of the brain is becoming organized when certain things are happening, because it really does make a difference. And, um, and what we see are parents who, when they were children, experienced neglect or adversity or abuse or whatever, and um, their then ability to nurture and attach and those kinds of things that we know are important have been impaired. And so, you know, we see the cycles of, um, of the, the parents that we work with who they were in foster care mm -hmm. and now their children are in foster care. Um, so it's a little, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not, um, you grew up in a home where trauma was present. Your father early on did not mm -hmm. to the same degree. Right. There, there was discrimination right. and oppression, but yeah. it was a very There was anti-Semitism, sort of, yeah. but no, there yeah. was a lot of love and, it, you know, right, right. this was how they lived. Yeah, so, so it's different. Yeah. And, and part of where the difference comes, what we know now is, is they, um, how the brain develops, mm -hmm. and, and so much of it happens in early childhood, so that if you have someone whose first five years was one where there was nurturing and attachment and whatnot, there is some basic architecture there that, that can allow them some capacity to, um, to be survivors. Mm. Um, where a lot of the, the young people we work with mm -hmm. and their parents right. um, had so many challenges during the period of time when their threat response system was becoming organized and mm -hmm. their relational neurobiology was becoming organized. Right. Yeah. And you just, you see the generational pattern over and over right. again. I mean, one of the things that's always struck me about um, different, the hidden children, which is sort of a, a, a really large category um, of which my father technically falls, although again, that includes like kids like my dad who were hiding, you know, with family in the woods because he was with his mother. Um, that might include somebody who was hiding on their own with strangers. That could include somebody in an orphanage. Like those are all hidden mm -hmm. children. Um, but one of the things um, that uh, Rebecca Clifford, who is a scholar who just came out with this wonderful book, Survivors, that looks at this group mostly, like children who um, survived, most of whom were hidden. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. Yale University Press, I think. Um, is this sort of disconnect that, that existed between the, the kids who survived, who in, you know, missed this kind of developmental moment um, and, and the guilt of the parents when they were reunited or reached a moment where there was some kind of, an, for lack of a better word, stability, although I don't know right. that stability would be the right word, right? And that sounds like that's kind of consistent with um, the world in which you're working, right? Where mm -hmm. there's just, you know, this, um, there's so many variables at play exactly. among these, these children and their parents. And, and that's the thing with um, our world, it's very complex, right. the human brain is very complex, and situations are very complex, and so there isn't one type of trauma. Right. There isn't one way that it's experienced. So let's take some questions, and if we run out of questions, we have a whole bunch from the students. Yes, please.
community. Right, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, this is a, a sample of this building. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Anything, mm. anything health wise, mm. anything negative. Are there questions? Yes, please. He said he, could, he couldn't go through life bitter. Would have ruined his life. I mean, he wouldn't have had a life. I mean, if, and plenty of them went through life bitter. Mm -hmm. And I know plenty of kids that are second generation like me that, you know, it, it was brutal. I mean, their, their parents were miserable and rightfully so. Their parents didn't tell them what went on. Their parents were bitter towards the world and everybody else. He just couldn't be that way. He wanted a life. And he w Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and... And he, yeah, and, and the fact that he just, the week my dad died, and it, it's really funny because uh, five, six weeks ago, I, I went and spoke in an Episcopal church in Cincinnati. And when I was done speaking that Sunday, these two women came up to me and they said, we heard your father speak in Sydney. Well, my dad, it was the last week of his life and he was speaking in Sydney, and I said, Dad, I don't want you to go, it's too much. And he goes, I'm not gonna disappoint the kids. These two people, you know, so, so my dad's gone 18 years, and come up to, I mean, I, I just lost it, lost it. But what an impact, and he said he wouldn't disappoint them. And as sick as he was, he went, and that was a Wednesday, and he passed away on Sunday. Mm. And, you know, and they remembered him, and, and they, had moved to, they had moved to Cincinnati a few years ago. And I happened to be there. Right. He's standing up on the latrine area in the barracks, and he's speaking Polish to these guys, and that was it. We were at so the back of the tour. Um, I guess I'm interested in sort of that transition from him, because he obviously wasn't talking about it when you were six and seven, and just sort of learning about it. Did it, did it slowly unfold, or was there like a, a watershed moment where he was like, I'm going to share this with you? Well, 
Well, it started, and my mother's mother started okay. talking so to me. To get so, so, yeah, because my, my mother just, she, she honestly, she didn't know what to do with either one of us, my dad or myself. <laughs> my brother was more like her. And, um, you know, so first it was grandma, and then it was, was my dad. And then yeah. did he start speaking, Debbie, sort of with that generation of survivors around the time that the Holocaust miniseries came out? And that's about when it started. Because that's really, like, for a lot of survivors, it was, right, it's, there was yeah. sort of a moment in the, in the 1980s. In the where, 80s, right. they had a world gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors yeah. in Israel. There were 30 to 40,000 of us. They said, one time we're all going to meet in Israel. And I go to Israel. So I worked at Children's in Cincinnati in the NICU. And I worked with this um, nurse, Judy Ryback. And, and we were friends. And um, you know, I ended up, after two years, I moved back to Columbus. And you know, there were no cell phones. And you lose track. We had dinner together, we went to the shopping center together, we went to the beauty shop together. I get on the bus in Jerusalem to go to the wall for the closing ceremony, and I sit on the bus, and you know how there's two seats and two seats, you know, for two people? Judy is sitting with her mother from Dayton, a Holocaust survivor. I didn't know. We never talked about it back then. Mm -hmm. This was in the 70s we worked together. She didn't, I mean, we looked at, and we're dear friends to this day. But people didn't, everybody knew about it, but people didn't discuss it. I mean, I talked about it with, you know, my, most of my dad's friends were, um, in, in Boston, the survivors, and in Canada, and every winter they would all come to Florida, and they'd, they'd all hang out together. So, I mean, I talked to all of those people. I knew all of their stories. My dad's friend Claire with her number, you know, it, you know, but no, people didn't talk. All of a sudden, in the early 80s, it became, Popular, uh, yeah. women getting on trains with their children, obviously we realize that they're not going to Auschwitz or, or Buchenwald, or, but it's the same emotion that they're being separated and they're being run out of their country and they're, you know, and are their husbands going to be murdered and are they going to make it out? And, and it's, you know, and it's the same it's just bubbling up. They're not getting it. Well, hello. It only takes one. When I'm in school with kids, I said, you start bullying this kid sitting next to you. I said, then all of a sudden, 10 of you are jumping in, and then 20 of you, and then you're sick, you know. And they're all pointing at you. And do you see this? Yeah, you, you have to relate it to something that they can understand. So. Um, yes, please. Uh, well, I mean, they, they're not teaching it like they were. It's not mandated to teach the Holocaust. I mean, I go into schools, in middle school they read Night, 
And so sometimes I get called in, but we're getting fewer and fewer calls from schools and we're getting older and we are the closest generation. And you know, you talk, I, I talk to some of my friend's grandchildren and you know, are you studying this in school? No. Well, we touched on it a little bit. Yeah, I think I read The Boy with the Striped Pajamas. Yeah, uh, right. I mean, I think uh, it, it is striking how few students I have coming into my classroom who have knowledge, who have good background in history. Um, and I mean, granted, I'm biased. I'm a historian, um, but uh, but there are some states that have pretty thorough requirements in the study of history over four years of high school, and there are some states where one can graduate with a high school degree and not have studied right. for four years of history. And, w and what happens when we don't remember the past? Um, Sam. There are some states where one has to study history for all four years in order to graduate high school, and there are, and there are some states where one does not. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I think we have time for one more question, maybe, Sammy? Sammy, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm related to that special education school, and this actually came up in Counting Miller's course on uh, Black Education Policy, which is a It's not that far away. It's not. I mean, I, I, right, I'm a big believer in studying comparative genocide. So, I mean, I don't, I, I am a historian of the Holocaust. That's what I'm trained in. Um, but I've also, I mean, one of the reasons why I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school so I could study somebody who worked on the Armenian genocide. There weren't that many scholars of the Armenian genocide at that time. Um, so so I, I'm not actually arguing that only the history of the Holocaust be, teach, be taught in schools. Um, I, I think it's really important that we learn how to have difficult conversations yes. with our kids. Um, and history is the study of difficult conversations. Um, right. and, and genocide's difficult. I, I mean, it, it, it is. It's, it's hard. It goes back to kind of what Debbie was saying about the kind of going into a school and kind of talking about the reality of, of human dynamics. Um, and so, so that would be my response. Would be you know we should we should be teaching we should be teaching the Holocaust we should be teaching Armenian genocide and on and on and on and on and it's it's unfortunate that the list is is so long and the, you know um, and, and getting longer and getting yeah. longer yeah oh I hate I hate ending on a on a bad note um, but it is eight o'clock and I promised Dana that we would that we would be done I would uh, just like to say one thing that came into yes. my mind. One of the things that makes trauma trauma is that, that the person has no control mm -hmm. over what is happening. One thing that helps people heal is when they take back their control, which is what your father did. That's yeah. what he did. And so it's, it's switching the game, and, and it's a sense of empowerment, which you do not have when you are in the midst of trauma. So bless him. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That is actually Thank the you. perfect way to end. So yeah. thank you.